God, son, what the hell are you doing? 364 more days till next year's hockey trials. I got a tough one. Yeah. doing great today brian how are you i'm doing well um uh much so an honor to to talk to you because uh i didn't expect to get this interview so um <laughs> i'm very happy about it and um just for the listeners uh could you describe uh who you are and what you've done over the past uh 40 50 years I know, I, yeah, I've been alive for a long time. <laughs> uh, I'm, it all kind of started when I was about 12 or 13 years old. I always played sports. I was always a tomboy and everything. But football was not a sport that I really knew well because back then girls just didn't do anything in that. We did, you know, we did softball and we did volleyball and swimming and basketball and everything else. But then my father, Dr. Calvin Nicholas, and my uncle, Dr. James Nicholas, became the two team physicians for the New York Titans who then became the New York Jets back in 63. And so I said, well, I better start learning a little bit about this. And I was lucky enough to have an earth science teacher at that time who came to games with us. And I started asking, and I'd stay after school. And that was my first introduction. And then Walt Michaels, who was then a coach with the Jets, and a very close friend of my dad's, he would be at the house a lot. So I would also pick his brain and learn and try to do everything. So that was my beginning in football. Um, and by 15, I was started to do my own, for some reason, mock drafts when I was around 15 or 16. But it was very different back then. You only had one game of the week on with Keith Jackson. And you had a Street and Smith magazine. And, you know, the Bob Hope show, if you ever, most people might not even have heard of Bob Hope. Oh, yeah. Bob Hope had, okay, so Bob Hope had a thing uh, where he had the All-American team on. And so that was basically, so then I would just kind of pick out players or draft. That's how it all began in my kind of my passion and love of the game. So, so now if you want to know what, yeah, go ahead. Well, well, I did have a question. So you're doing mock drafts. Okay. And how old are you here? 12, 16, 16, so, oh, 15. Six, 16, 15 years old doing mock drafts. What were the reactions of some of the people seeing a 15 or 16 year old girl doing mock drafts? Most people didn't, first of all, didn't know I was doing it. I was just doing it on my own. And I picking out players and I like I picked out Ron Yarry, who went to USC and he ended up being a great player. But my second pick that I was hoping for the Jets was Garrett Ford, who was a running back from West Virginia, who turned out to not have a good career. So I was one for two, which is about what, <laughs> what is normal. And <laughs> that's how it all kind of. So I just started doing that, you know, each each year. But as time went on, then I ended up going first I went to an all girls college where I played basketball they did not have scholarships for women at that time at all so you just played because you love the sport so I played for two years there and it was all girls school at Wheaton College up in Massachusetts and it was very nice but there was something missing and I decided I transferred to the Ohio State University and that changed my whole life too because uh, that was the Woody coach Woody Hayes and days and they were a great team uh, they had just gone to the Rose Bowl the, you know, the year before I got there. Uh, football was just the be all and ev everything at Ohio State. Right. And so that, that kind of that was really where everything grew more and more. Plus, the Jets they had won the Super Bowl when I was a high school senior 
And I was at the Super Bowl when Joe Namath guaranteed it, Super Bowl three, mm-hmm. the most exciting and most important Super Bowl of all time because it um, legitimized the um, AFL because we were always looked down upon by, by the NFL and the Giants and all the established teams. So to win the Super Bowl, be the first team in the AFL to do that after the first two losses, and then also to beat the Giants, who were an arch enemy uh, because they always looked down at us. We beat them. It was only a preseason, but it was taken like a real game. Even Joe Namath said it was as important, if not more important, than the Super Bowl when we were playing it, and we killed the Giants. Ali Sherman got fired afterwards, and then the Jets totally owned New York. It was the greatest feeling in the world. And that's when, as I said, that was my senior year in high school. So, um, and those players were always over at my house because my father had his office connected to the house. So I grew up just with um, with all, of, whether it was Joe Namath, Emerson Boozer, Matt Snell, George Sauer, you know, all those guys from Super Bowl three. Wow. That, that <laughs> so it's, it's almost like you, you immediately just got that, that inside, you know, scoop of, of, everything that's going on, how things are, are really besides watching it on TV. And yes. you were able to, did that just light the fire even more? Oh, oh, yes. I mean, I just became so passionate about it and as well as Ohio state. And so one day what I did was um, the team ate uh, the Ohio state football team ate over at the student union. So I took Woody Hayes's book. You win with people that I had walked over there one day and waited for the team to come out, and he came out, and I introduced myself to him. I had him sign the book, which I still have and everything. And he was as nice as could be, and we talked for a while. I told him about my passion. I said I was majoring in dietetics and nutrition, but I was just choosing any old major, but that wasn't a passion or anything. So he said, well, come over and meet at the stadium. So I did, and he said, you know, right now, at this time, there were no women doing anything. There was you know, no women announcers, no trainers, no coach, of course, no coaches. Um, it was just no sideline report. I, you, you name it. At that point, there really was nothing. He said, but you know, you have such a passion and a love for the game. Don't give up. You never know where life is going to lead you. So just, you know, keep going with this. And he said, but I want you to come anytime you want uh, to any practices, whether they are open or closed to scouts or to anybody. And then when the scouts that you can talk with them, learn, and be there every day. So, of course, I skipped a lot of classes. <laughs> had my sorority sisters do my, uh, <laughs> some of my work for me. <laughs> and I would, go to, I would go to practice every single day, besides the games and everything. So that was a, you know, a big thing in my life. And as well as the Jets during the summertime and going to training camp every summer and spending a lot of time with them at that point. So that's where that all happened. And then the... The big turning point, I had a job at my high school, Babylon High School in Long Island, to do, teach home ec and then coach girl sports on the side. Because now you had Title IX had just passed, I think, 72 or 73, and I graduated in 74. No, that, that's what I thought I was going to do. And then my father had his 50th birthday party, and there were a lot of friends, family, and some Jets there. And I just was table hopping, talking to people like I always do. I sat down with Charlie Winter, who was the head coach of the Jets at the time. And we talked football for quite a while. And then he said, you know what? We're building a brand new complex at Hofstra University where we're, you know, where they are playing right now, you know, practicing, actually having the training camp. He said, but we're building our own Weeb Bank Hall. He said, um, you love the sport. I could hire somebody outside, but he said, you have such a passion and you know sports and you know football and you know everything that I'm talking about. Would you consider working for us? And I just went, oh, that's the answer to my life. All right, sorry, goodbye to the other job. And uh, <laughs> went to work for the Jets in 74 in the new building. That was the first. So to, to go back for a moment or two, so you said that you would, a lot of, a lot of class was skipped um, and your sorority sisters would do your homework. Yes. So <laughs> they would do the sewing, sewing and stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> so these the, these sisters in the sorority had to know how passionate you were about this. Yes, they did. I was president of my sorority, and so we would march around on Saturday mornings before the Ohio State game and be fighting, doing the fight song. So they all, yes, 
we they all knew about that. We made Joe Namath like our little brother. I sent him a ZTA shirt, Zeta Taufa, that was my sorority. He wore it all the time. So they, yes, they definitely knew my passion and they still know it to this day. That's awesome. It's really, really good to have that foundation of people who know your goals, what you're passionate about and are willing to stand behind you and not just be there you know, when the parade is there after you've already completed it. Yes, I was very fortunate. You know, the, the, the way they all were, everybody, as I said, everybody understood it and got right, right in line. We had a, we had a great time with the whole thing. It yeah. was really wonderful. A, a great, and this was back in the late sixties where, you know, being in a sorority wasn't considered totally cool because there was all kinds of stuff going on in the world, but I had a wonderful time. That's awesome. So you get the, you get the job, right? You, you're with the Jets now. Yes. Is there... Is there any, like, awareness that you are the first female scout at this point? No, because when I first went in, I was the only girl in the office. At this point, it was the coaches, the training staff, uh, the general uh, general manager, head coach. It was all football people. The New York City had the um, – they had, like, the comptrollers, accountants, anything that was on the business side. Anything football was out at Hofstra, but I was the only person. So I was the receptionist first, as well as doing scouting, um, secretary scouting. So I was filing and doing all kinds of stuff. But I was also, which I love being the receptionist, because whoever called on the phone, I knew who they were. And at that time, every people didn't have other assistants or secretaries with them. So you would just, you know, if somebody asked for somebody, you would put them right through. Or if they didn't, you'd end up talking to everybody and get to know so many people. So it was a great job. The only thing is, as far as I didn't know how to do any secretary work, I went to school, to college, and in those days, you either became secretarial work, you know, that you went there, or you went to school. So I didn't even know how to type. And, you know, just little basic. So I I had to bluff my way through all that. There's no such thing as Google. You could, if somebody said, here, I need you to write a letter to the general manager of another team. I didn't know the form. And you had white out on the typewriter. You didn't have computers. And I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to kind of figure things out. They finally hired one more woman that came in. And she was the she was the, uh, the secretary to the head coach. And uh, so the two of us were there together. And she had a lot of knowledge. So it was really good, the two of us working together. So it was, it was a very interesting part. This, the part about scouting didn't come till later. Yeah. Um, what happened was I was doing this, and in 1975, I was in the room all the time when they were discussing um, who they were drafting and all that kind of stuff. So at that time, it was 17 rounds. It was not seven rounds like it is now. It went from 17 to 12 to 7. And it was no, there was no ESPN. There was no coverage of it. You just went and you did it. So when it got to the 17th round, uh, my boss, Mike Holovac, who was – one of my mentors, he played for Boston College. He was the head coach of the Patriots for many years. And he was with us as a coach and then director of player personnel. He and Al Ward, who were the general manager at the time, uh, they said, you're going to make the last pick. So I actually made the last draft pick. It's still the only female to ever have made the, an actual pick. And so I did that. And that was like the very first, uh, you know, the very first thing that I had done. So that was in 75. And then after that, um, I was work, still working and doing things. And then Al, one day we were working on game plans. We would do the game plans back in the locker room and typing things into things. And Al Ward and, and Mike Holliback said, Connie, we want you to do some scouting. So I said, oh, okay, that'd be great. So they sent me to Ohio State, Boston College, the Orange Bowl. Uh, they had me uh, grading films. At that time, it was reel to reel. And then you would grade the players on films. And uh, they, and then later on, interview players and stuff like that. So it was a, it was great. Uh, I didn't know it was a big deal. And if if Dick Young, who was a great writer for the Sporting News and the Daily News, he wrote about me being called the Girl Scout and the first female Scout, and a few other people. And then when I went to Ohio State, they wrote an article because I had gone there about me. So, it, but it, now nowadays everything is a big story for when a woman gets ahead in some way now but it was for it's really 40 years later that really there's so much headway the last ever since jen welter with bruce arians who really got the ball rolling hired that 
it seemed like that really got things going. And then from there, you know, you see what we have now as far as whether it's in scouting and coaching and communications and sideline report, you know, everything. So it's just like, whoo, you know, blowing up. Yeah. So when you started getting sent to, you know, Ohio State, Boston College, all of these places, the Orange Bowl, all of these places that you're getting sent to, when did it start to get more surreal that, wow, this is, you know, you're going to all these places. Did it hit then that you're like, okay, th- this is where I'm at now. This is this is where it begins and this isn't going to stop. No, I honestly, you know, maybe I was just a naive person, but growing, just growing up, and this was the one place that I felt confident was in football. I wasn't confident that much in myself and in a lot of other things, but in football, I just always did. So talking to guys about football, I just felt very, very natural didn't know uh, that it was that that huge deal, mm-hmm. uh, as I said, because we didn't make a big deal about it. But about after about a year and a half or, or so of doing this, uh, Mr. Hess, Mr. Leon Hess, became the sole owner of the, the Jets. They had had like four or five owners together, and then he bought them out, and he became so. Um, he said that no longer could a female be, you know, traveling to represent, which I understood because you have to remember this is the seventies. Title IX had just started. Um, he didn't, and I could still scout. I could still uh, locally. I could still write reports on film, talk to player, whatever else, things like that. But this was a different world, and he was an older gentleman, a wonderful guy. So it's funny. I, I guess I'm so happy that I didn't get up and say, "Well, you know, who do you think you are? I'm a woman, or something like like that." Because that's that. Well, first of all, that's not me. Right. Second thing is, second thing is, I love my Jets more than anything in the world. And the third thing is, I, I, I just, no matter what, uh, just being there, whatever they were going to have me to do, I was, I was still thrilled to do, even if I was disappointed at the moment. So, and if I had just gotten up and left, the thing that eventually happened, actually a year and a half later, you know, with finding Mark Gastineau would never have happened. So, you know, you never know in life. Sometimes we can cut off our nose to spite our face sometimes, yeah. looking at the small picture instead of a, a big picture of, of, say, a passion and a love. Don't give it up for anything. That's a great, great statement. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you really think about it, I don't think people really um, push forward in their life to find out the, the real capabilities. And I believe when you yeah. get through into that journey where, or when you start that journey, I personally believe that is the beginning of your actual wisdom the beginning of your actual knowledge and your passion. Exactly right. And so that's, as I said, that's, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm young. It's a different world. Sometimes it's hard for people to, to when they, if they're, you know, if they're born in the eighties or nineties to understand what the world was like back then, it was was a very different world in in the, in football and especially. So you have to look at it coming, coming from that era, era. And as I said, I, I just, I loved whatever I did there. And that's why I always try to tell young people if they're doing an internship, which is one of the greatest things, uh, doesn't matter what it's in, because first of all, you might find you love it, or you might find something else while you're doing that internship, or you may find the one person who believes in you and says, you know what, I like that person's work ethic, or I, man, I think she's going to go places, or he's going to go places, or whatever it may be. And it just takes one person to believe in you. Yeah, and that's and that's how it goes in sports. But I think, you know, you can't think you're above anything. And as I said back then, it was a very different world without computer. Just try to imagine no cell phones when you try to find a player um, and to bring them to talk to them, bring them in. They just had regular old phones, and you very hard to find them sometimes to to do what you had to do. Uh, it's not like a cell phone; they weren't all easy for the for the um, teams to to always reach uh it was a very very different world and typewriters as i said so but nowadays you can say i okay who's left at six foot two 240 and runs a four six and uh, you know the computer can spit it out you have all that information right at your fingertips which we didn't have back then Hmm. going back to the draft where they allowed you to to make one of the selections in the draft do you remember the person that you picked Yes, I took Mike Bartosik, who was a tight end wide receiver for Ohio, the Ohio State University. 
And, uh, you know, he wasn't one of the first ones cut. So I was happy with that, especially in the 17th round. And, um, you know, we didn't have that draft. We didn't, in fact, that draft, we didn't have a lot of superstars, just Joe Fields. And he was actually drafted in the 14th round. But I was, you know, as I said, I was just shocked, first of all, to, that they would want me to be the one to, to make this choice. And I was very, just very honored with the whole thing. Yeah. If, so knowing back then, you know, it was a different world, you know, um, were there any times that maybe, um, I don't want to say that you were looked down upon, but maybe looked at differently because you were a female? You know, if that happened, um, I really didn't notice it because I told you, I, I always felt confident in it. The only person, you know, Howard Cosell was a tough guy, but I, um, he was just tough to everybody. And when he would call in and want to speak, he was very forceful and just, you know, not a super kind person, but that, that's his, that was his personality in life. So I didn't take it as, well, it's because I'm a female. I just said, oh, okay, that's just the way, you know, that's the way he is. <laughs> yeah. So, but most, but I tell you, most men, uh, I had, I just had so many great male mentors between Walt Michaels, Mike Holovac, Lou Holtz, Coach Holtz and I, because he had coached at Ohio State. And so we had Woody Hayes in common when he came there. And so, um, I, and I've stayed in touch with him for, you know, forever, he and his family. And so I had a lot of, uh, besides my earth science teacher, I have, I've had a lot of great male mentors that took a lot of time with me. So I, again, I was very blessed. And then when players were, you know, they would come over and I'd sit and talk with them, asking them questions. And so, as I said, I was very, very fortunate in my position uh, growing up. And I know that I was fortunate. Um, but I guess it came across that I, you know, really, in fact, when I met my husband, he, uh, our dates were kind of looking at reel to reel films and grading. <laughs> that was our first date. <laughs> it was Joe and stuff like that. So it was Joe Delaney, who um, was so sad he drowned trying to save a person from the Kansas City Chiefs. But I just remember, you know, watching that. And he was always so proud through all the years um, of my abilities and just being able to talk to people about, about sports all the way through till, till now. Yeah. So how how did you meet your husband? I was I was working for the Jets, and uh, it was 1977, and I went over to the Westbury Music, not Westbury uh, Holiday Inn, and I went there for lunch a lot of times. And I was eating a great Reuben sandwich; it was so delicious. <laughs> and when I eat my food, <laughs> nothing distracts me usually. You you, you was, remember what you were eating? <laughs> yeah, I do. I so funny. <laughs> I said, it was so good. It, I, I can still visualize it, <laughs> and. Uh, he walked in, but the place was full, and we looked at one another. And um, it was kind of a funny story, you know, how you do it. And I thought, well, that, that's it, And I, because the place was full. So I got up, and I was talking. There was a basketball team or something staying there, and I was talking to them because uh, they were staying there because they had the uh, New York, you know, the Long Island, New York Nets, whatever they were back then, at, playing at the Coliseum. And so then um, I didn't see – I walked out, and I didn't see him. So there's a, there's a ladies room on that floor and a ladies room on the floor below. So I didn't, so I just went down to the ladies room floor below. I walked out and he came running down the hallway and uh, that was it. We started talking and um, I, first I said, I'm right, sure, you know, I, I just asked him about real, to make sure he was for real, <laughs> you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then we started, I was still living at home at the time. And then we started dating and, um, as I said, he was uh, he was a giant fan when I met him, but he sure had to change into a Jeff fan. He had no choice. <laughs> so just just so I get this on record, you were able to to convert a Giants fan into a Jets fan. Oh, very definitely. Yep. Oh, he had first of all, he had, if you wanted to be with me, <laughs> there's no way. It's just you know because the Giants were right. If he had been a fan of the uh, say the L.A. Rams, I probably could have lived with it. But the Giants were, at that time, they were the nemesis, not not the Patriots when I first met them. Then it became the Dolphins in the 80s. Then it went to the Patriots after that. But at that time, as I said, it was it was the Giants that we were you know, feeling that way when I first met him. Did you, did you ever catch him kind of sneak peeking you know, a couple of Giants games every now and again with Lane McGinning? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, he, he was really good about it. He really, as I said, came right, he came right over, right into the family. Um, and just, it just fit right in. I was just, I was very blessed. I really was, you know, he passed away two years ago, but I had him 40 years. We had a great marriage. Uh, I have a wonderful son with them who's married and I live near in Orlando and I have a stepdaughter 
and she's married with a daughter up in Connecticut. And so I've been very, very blessed for so many years. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that, that he passed. Um, yeah. Do any of your children carry on your passion? <laughs> Yeah, I'm very lucky. Both my son and my stepdaughter are Jeff fans, and my my, step, my, my stepdaughter actually her husband played for the uh, for the Hurricanes, you know, back you know quite a few years ago, and stuff. So, but and so he was a Dolphin fan because he was down there. So I, I try not to hold it too much against him because he's a great guy. But you know, luckily, Lisa and Chris are both you know diehard Jeff fans. I would take Chris to camp every single year in the summer from the time he was what five months old and he, he's become, he'd be coming up to camp and you know so he is it and his wife is too and now I have my two grandkids with them and you know poor kids the first thing they learn is j-e-t-s jets 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 <laughs> that is amazing they're, they're growing up correctly is what you're telling me um yeah <laughs> Um, <laughs> I agree so di- diving into this so you, you're you're a scout especially in a time that is not, you know, filled with technology, you know, yeah. everything is uh, basically either handwritten, typed, um, the information you have to get, you have to go find, um, yes. and everything is raw, you know, everything is right yes. there in front of you that you have to see and you have to evaluate and you have to analyze. What are some of the great things about that job and what were some of the more difficult things about that job? Well, I said, when I first got there, my head was swimming because I didn't know what I was doing as a secretary. I love the receptionist part. That was a piece of cake. I love that. But as far as, as I said, all the other secretarial stuff, that was, you know, that was the hard part and people would walk by and I would stop typing because I knew I, they were, I didn't want to get embarrassed or whatever. But I was just, I was lucky that they hired me for my knowledge and passion, not for my skills. And then as time went on, you know, cause I was there seven years, then I, I learned enough to get by with all that kind of stuff. So, but I loved, oh, there was nothing like draft day. It's probably the greatest day, you know, other uh, than marriage and having kids. That is the greatest day. Um, and then being in the room and calling in who we were drafting and hearing what's going on and getting the cards ready even beforehand that we would be putting up on the wall. And those were all the uh, the best the best things, um, and then eventually learning you know to, to grade players, writing it up, uh, working with the scouts, setting up their travel, and having them call in. So that was always the um, you know that was the best part. The hardest part was probably I had a my last boss was tough, and uh, he didn't know me uh, at all or anything about me, and he was uh, he came in kind of like gangbusters. And then um, I had always been out going to practice and done a lot of different things. So I had to kind of uh, stand up and say, no, no, this is very important to me to, to go to practice and do these things to keep furthering myself and know what's going on. And, um, and he, he finally, he did come around and he's the one that called when he was on the road uh, to have me find a substitute for the senior bowl, which in turn became Mark Astonoff. There it is. There's there's that <laughs> name, Mark Gastineau. Yes. Can I you love him. he's great. Can you take me through what it was like to be part of the SAC exchange? To be Wow, it's interesting. Well, we I I got all four guys were drafted during the time that I was there. As you know, 76 and 77, Joe Klecko was like a 6th round pick. So, and Abdul Salam, who his name was Larry Falk from Kent State, and they became Abdul Salam. And both, you know, and, and so of course I knew them very well. Then, not in 78, but 79 was when we drafted number one, Marty Lyons, and number two, Mark Astineau. And that became the SAC exchange. And as I said, you know, they were, they, you know, they, that year, that one year they had them plus Greg Buttle and a few other sacks that came in, but there was a total of 66 sacks, which I don't think we'll ever, <laughs> I don't think we'll ever match that again, but it was, uh, you know, they were all, all different personalities. You know, um, Klecko was your, he had been a truck, t- truck driver. He was this tough blue collar guy. Marty was well known from university of Alabama. Abdul was a quiet guy, but just a very strong, wonderful person. 
And then you had a Mark who was like a young colt full of energy and all over the place, but, but has so much ability. And, but they all didn't see eye to eye all the time. They do now. They make appearances together and everything like that. But, you know, you had four strong individuals back then. And you had when when uh, Mark would do his sack dance, which they, of course, eventually kind of outlawed. Now guys are jumping all over the place on every play. But back then, and he never did it on over a quarterback. Like when, if he sacked him, he always turned away and did it, you know, and did his gyrations further away. And he had done that in college at East Central Oklahoma as well. But, you know, so the fans loved it. Some of the players weren't that wild about it. But as I said, you know, that's all, that's all part of the whole thing. And that team was really good. I mean, they got one game away from the Super Bowl in 82. I had just left the year before. And uh, if, if uh, Don Shula had put the tarp down, I really think we would have, you know, won that game. But uh, that's another story. Uh, but I think, as I said, it's been a, the sack exchange was really exciting. And you, as I said, you played every down. And our linebackers and we had, you know, Bobby Jackson and Kenny Troy. We had defensive backs, Daryl Ray. And we had a really, um, you know, we had a really good team. And then offensively, um, you know, we went from, we had, after Namath, we had Richard Todd and, and who was our in 76. And then we had um, Kenny O'Brien, of course, in the class of 83 kept coming later, um, which we chose instead of Dan Marina, which a lot of teams did. <laughs> I uh, I was actually talking to uh, the class I'm taking now with uh, Russell Landy. He, um, yeah. you know, we had the discussion last night about Russell Wilson. And, yeah. you know, height was the big thing, you know? It was. It was. Because he was a great baseball player and he did really well at NC State. And whatever the reason there that the coach, I don't know, you know, chose Mike Lennon. And said that, you know, instead of Russell, and Russell went to Wisconsin. And in that one year, he was, you know, Wisconsin's not known for quarterbacks. I mean, they're known for great offensive linemen and, and you know, you know, just and tough defenses and stuff. But when Russell was there, I mean, he was amazing and he had a great. But the only thing that really at that time, you know, there weren't any per se shorter quarterbacks. Um, you know, Drew Brees was the shortest at six foot. and it just was that was like breaking the breaking the barrier there. D Doug Flutie probably would would be fine now, even though he was you know five ten, five nine, just like uh, Kyler Murray. So he would have thrived in the game of today because the game of today is completely different yeah. than the game back when I was there. And you could see, you know, for the past years that Drew Brees, as he's holding the ball, he is trying to look over his offensive yes. line. <laughs> That's right. He always had that way of doing that. You're exactly right. I can but, just, yes. You but can he picture threw him. it right on the dime. Yep. Accuracy. Yeah. You know, as I said, so it's very interesting because back then, even all the way up until basically the CBA, which changed things because in the old days, it, you always said it was four to five years to develop a quarterback. Okay. And they, they had to learn. And so they had to come up to the pro ranks and learn as to how to take, you know, to be under center, how to stand tall in the pocket and take a hit and look at when they're, when guys are barreling down them and they still have to be accuracy. Of course, was always big, but it was a very difficult game. Now the game, because first of all, with the CBA, the, with the rookie contract, you got to play guys sooner. So now they have the RPOs, which cha has changed it. So now you're not just looking at guys that are just standing in the pocket. Now they're saying, can he extend the play? Can he throw off different platforms? Um, it's a, it's completely the opposite. Um, you know, than what, than what it was pre-2011 and then even more the last couple of years where, as I said, every all these quarterbacks, and then it, it's almost like the pros are doing more college offense than, the, than it used to be. And it used to be they had to adjust to the pros, but they don't have time anymore because by then if you develop them, you got to give them the second contract. Like, and you don't know if you want to give them that big contract then. Yeah, it's a, it's a different realm now with uh, with those contracts because what I'm seeing is that, like you said, you know they have to be played sooner. You know what I mean? They have to be in in more and faster. And um, you know, look at Peyton Manning. He, he didn't do good his first three years. No, if you looked out at Troy Aikman, you, I mean, you look at most of the guys 
you know, that's why Marino was very unusual for his first year to have. So that was like way out of the ordinary. That yeah. just didn't happen for a rookie quarterback to step in and, and just play. I mean, Chad Pennington didn't. He sat for a couple of years for the Jets. Um, and then he took him to the playoffs three different times when he was healthy. Um, but, uh, that, you know, that was just much more common. The same like what Aaron, what Aaron Rodgers and, and Brett and different things like that. But now, you know, it just um, it's, it is a very, very different world with the quarterbacks. What's one of the uh, toughest and what's one of the easiest things to scout on a player? And if you want to go with whatever position is more comfortable for you, that's fine. Yeah. What would be the most, you know, just like, well, it's really, there's, there's so many different things. And depending on the position, it would be, you know, as I said, slot receivers, were never really in vogue, but then Wayne Corbett's kind of started that. And then it's been, you know, you had uh, Wes Welker and you can come through all the different guys and, you know, Edelman and all the different people now, um, you know, quickness of the quickness off the line. Now you, cause you can't hit players the way you used to, you used to be able to hit players. Uh, the defensive backs could hit them, you know, all the way down the field. Now it, then it turns to just within five yards you can't do over the middle. It used to take a tough receiver to go over the middle because they were either going to be clotheslined or really hit, but now it's called a defenseless receiver. So now, and, and hands were so important. Now it doesn't seem like that is quite as important. It's the ability to separate. Mm -hmm. That's what now seems to be. Can he separate? You know, um, then every so often there'll be a guy that doesn't like an Anquan Bolden, who is not a great separator, but had was physical and tough and, you know, stuff. And like how, how many people were wrong on DK Metcalf because he didn't run the cone drill as fast or whatever. They said he couldn't bend <laughs> and he could only do one type of receiving. So as I said, every, every position, um, running backs, uh, you have to be able to block. You know, that's the thing. They all, they all most, you can find a good running back, but to be able to pass protect is still very important. And so that's, that's something you want to see you want to see develop. Um, offensive linemen are really tough now because the quarterback's moving all over. Before you know, and so when they have the, the zone, they have the regular, and it's it's as I said, every every position is different. But the most important, you can't measure the heart, and you can't measure the dedication and the love of the game, and that's what seems to separate people. There's, of course, the talent to some degree, but people that just really love to play football and our team players um, that are willing to just give everything that they've got and have this, this heart because, you know, half the league or at least 40% or 50% are free agents. So if, if that's so, so, it's telling you that those height, weight, speed measurables are not just the answer anymore. Yeah. I um going back to what you said, and I, I will get reamed a new one if I don't say this uh, from my buddy down in North Carolina. Uh, Forest. I was one of those people who said DK Metcalf would be a bust, strictly because okay. of what you just said. Actually, exactly yes. what you said. So many people felt that. As I said, you know, the other thing is he might have been a bust on other teams. That's this is what's the difference now too. Some guys, um, you put them on a certain team, and they have they're meant for that offense. You know, um, and then with the West Coast offense versus the long ball. You know, if they, they want, some teams want guys. On, if you're now, if you're on the Saints, you want guys that can get deep. If you're using Jameis Winston, okay, with the kind of the Shanahan style, you want guys that are really good route runners, can get off the line, that type of stuff. But you also they and also be willing to block. You also have to be willing to block as a as a receiver. So it, you know everything. As I said, I don't know if DK would have been as good, but I also think um, Russell and Seattle use him. The you know perfect for their scheme and what they do they they don't uh, take a guy and make him fit into their scheme they adjust and say what's going to make this player the best player he can be hmm. and that's where I think that you know that's so often you see a guy will make it on one team and then go to another team and not make it or vice versa yeah um, you know because people have been cut all over and then had a second wind on it at another team because they they fit that scheme. I have three other people um, that I'll tell you who, who I think is going to be great. I think yeah. Jordan Love is going to be great. Um, okay. I think Tua will eventually be a bust. 
Um, and I said, Johnny Manziel will not make it. But Johnny Manziel, yeah. I said, because of his mental. That, oh, yeah. Johnny Manziel, just, I know I kind of put on Twitter, I was saying Colin Cowherd, when he was kind of trying to compare a Zach Wilson to Johnny Manziel, I said, there's no, first, there's no comparison because, first of all, um, Manziel was three inches shorter. He was got in trouble. He, you know, there was domestic abuse. There was alcohol. So it was, as like you said, his mind, and he had a lot. He had a lot of problems. Uh, Zach Wilson has done none of those things. Very accurate. He's also, uh, when I was up at camp, the, you could see the Jets during practice were just working so much on with Zach in the pocket, in the pocket, every day, just so that he's not just looking at one person and then escaping like you can do in college. You know, it's a very different thing like that. Plus, he's more. You know, um, like Zach is a slighter build than say a um, a Trey Lance or a um, Justin Fields, and that's the only thing I worry about. I don't want him to get hurt. Please, we have enough Jets getting hurt right now, <laughs> so I, I worry about that all the time. But you know, Jordan Love, I you know there were I think he's going to be good. He just needed much. He needed more work. Um, is it Johnny? Oh, who's the second one you said? I said Johnny Tua. Oh, Tua, yeah, Tua. I mean, there was no question Tua was going to be. Awesome. And then that, you know, that hip injury, because, you know, your lower body, it makes, but I still think he's got enough. And with the Dolphins, again, with the Dolphins scheme, I think they have a great coach. Mm -hmm. He's he's already shown that, Brian Flores. And I think, you know, they're able to, and he learned a lot from Fitzpatrick. Again, they have somebody there to kind of wean him along as, and and he could watch him. So I still think he's going to be good. I don't, I mean, he's not going to be Mahomes. Right. I, you know, you don't have to be Mahomes to win. So, no, we've we've yeah. proven that with uh, Mark Sanchez. I mean, you need a decent quarterback with a great O line. You can do. I yes. mean, look at Tony oh. Romo. You know, Tony Romo oh. had all the time in the world to throw the ball to Des Bryant. Yes, and that's the whole thing. When you look back and when Sanchez, that offensive line that he had with Alan Fanica and Damian Woody and DeBrickashaw and I mean, you know, at Mangold. I mean, those guys. And those guys never got hurt. And he had an amazing offensive line. He had a really – Dustin Keller, an underappreciated tight end that was always there as a safety valve for him. Then they went and got some receivers. He had Thomas Jones one year. You know, he had some LT another year. So he did, He had a lot of good skill, um, you know, a lot of skilled people around him. And he um, – I think – it's so funny. I think Mark was – his first – when he was playing like Mark – and just letting it wing and doing different things, he was really good. And then I think they made him think too much. And when you hesitate, I think, and you start thinking so much, you know, it, it didn't work. But you're exactly right. I think, I mean, we, we came within a, oh, we came awful close <laughs> twice. <laughs> and I give credit to where credit's due to Brickishaw Ferguson only missed one snap. Not one game, one snap. And that was because one of a snap. substitute. Because of the yep. scheme they were trying to do, I think they used Darrell Revis as a blocker. Um, uh, that's exactly right. Yes, isn't that unbelievable? He, I mean, isn't that amazing? The guy you say he never got hurt. It's amazing. Mangold played for many, many years before he got hurt. You know, it's way later. I was when you look back, even look at the sack exchange guys. Look at them. It seems like now it sounds. I don't know why, but it seems like they're practicing less and hitting less with pads and stuff. But it just seems like they get hurt as much if not more uh especially with lower body and i don't i don't know what the whole thing is in acls and achilles and stuff like that so um but it, it is so interesting and you take a guy like like brady and you take a guy like eli manning and even flacco now, flacco only got hurt one time eli manning the giants never had to worry about a backup for 15 years ever yeah. he never got hurt and then brady only had the one year that he got hurt out of, out of 22 years and then you know you have other guys that get hurt every year. That was the greatest. Uh, that was the greatest year for Jets fans when he. <laughs> oh, I do. Unbe- we, unbelievable. We felt like we had a chance, you know. I know, and they still. I know they still come through. You know, amazing. So going in, be- going into like, um, you know, you, you talked about uh, you know slot receivers. You know what I mean? And those the guys can that can run routes really really well. Um, you yes. know, what do you think about having, I mean, I know Crowder is on his last contract year, you know, I, honestly, I think that they're probably going to trade him since they lowered his salary and they might be able to get a little bit of, a little bit of capital for next year's, um, draft. But 
I think he's an excellent route runner. I think uh, Elijah Moore is phenomenal. Um, yes. I just want to see him in real time now. And um, I'm still unsure about Mims. I'm not too, too sure yet. Um, he's been hurt a little bit. so. But uh, That's the problem. Yeah, I think he's got <laughs> some grit in him, but I still want to see it. No, and he, you know, last year he had what, two pulled hamstrings. Then he came back and got hurt again. And then now he missed all the, you know, OTAs. Um, and so I think, you know, he's also, a, he's a Baylor receiver, the you know, Flyers, you know, Baylor receivers, and they just go. So I think c- coming into this type of off- offense when he hasn't had all that may be difficult um, to pick up right away. So um, he, you know, as long as he has it in here in the heart, that's the whole thing. If he has the, the, that kind of grit and stuff, like he showed that that one, uh, that one play, you know, against the uh, giants, was it Mm -hmm. where he made that, where he, that's what we have to see more of. Um, You know, I said, I think uh, one thing good about more, he he can play outside and he can play slot. So, and I do like Crowder. Crowder is, you know, we, we need a few veteran presence in our, our long snappers are probably our most veteran guy, yeah. you know, Hennessy. So we, it's good to have, and then of course we would have had Carl Lawson and those guys, but then they got hurt. Yeah. And Jared Davis. And that, that really hurts. It really hurts. I'm going to, I'm going to run you through, through, through some uh, questions real quick, uh, specifically from a scouting mind now. Okay. okay. I'm going to do comparisons. I want to see who, who you think yep. is better than okay. the other or who you would pick for a team. Um, Sermon or Atien, the running back. Um, oh, I was. It's funny. Tr- Trey Sermon came. If he stays, if he's healthy, I like. I like that. He's a, he's a big physical runner. That's why I like him. Yeah, yeah. I th- I was I was looking at that too. I think that he's he is just a mountain of muscle. That's really what he yes. is. And he came on so strong. I said. Then he got hurt. Now, if he's able to stay healthy, that's the whole thing. If he is, boy, I think yeah, he's a. Real physical, tough runner. Yeah. Um, we'll go uh, – we're going to go exactly how this kind of went. We're going to go Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, and who was the other guy that went? Trey Lance. Justin Fields? I'm going go, to go Trey okay. Lance on you. Wow. Okay. Wow. It's a tough one. This was a, this I, I went back and forth because I really like Justin Fields a lot. Okay. As well, okay, I really do. I'm a, I'm a, just watching him and his toughness, and he's a real smart kid. I mean, he turned down Harvard. Um, I just, I, I just like, I like the way he acts. I like everything about him. Um, and of course, watching, and I'm a Buckeye, but I, but you know, I try to be. I was going to say there's a trend there. <laughs> <laughs> but I can be, and I can be, but I, I mean, he showed a lot of stuff. Now, mm-hmm. so much, again, so much depends on where you land. I mean, you saw Trevor Lawrence the other night with Jacksonville. The guy had no time. It was like watching poor Sam Darnold. You know, he had, he had no time to throw whatsoever. And he was not getting the, you know, he's not there yet where he's getting rid of the ball quickly. And then he ran with the ball and he took that hit. So he, he still has to learn. I mean, I think he's, he's awesome. Mm. But, and then Zach is right now, um, my only concern on Zach, I really, I always like Zach. Um, but my concern on him was just his slight build and the fact that he already had an injury in the shoulder that had an operation. And the other one has something, and they had an ankle in high school. But staying healthy, he's smart. Again, he's smart. He loves the you – know, no question, he loves the game. He's obsessed with the game. And to mm. me, that's really good. And he has the quickest release of them all by far. His, he just flicks. His, you know, the others, some may have a little stronger arm, but they, they don't just flick the ball the way he does. Right. So, a tra- and, and Trey Lance, as I said, you know, he has such a small sample, um, great – strong arm but as i said he went to a great team you put trey lance on the jets i i don't think so yeah trey lance with the 49ers you know they have a, he's got a, a team surrounding him um just a lot less pressure that way so i think he will be and i, I was a big fan of mac jones too yeah oh, very, very I, big I, fan I, of mac, because i Go ahead. No, I was going to say I I, I kind of wasn't. And it was only because of, uh, I think it was one of the games that he was throwing. He was throwing behind the uh, the running back, like on those flare outs. Oh. He was throwing behind it. And I was just like, I don't think this is, I, I'm, not tr- I'm not trustworthy in him. 
even though the Jets weren't going to take him anyway. But then as soon as I saw the Patriots picked him up, I was like, well, the Patriots can make anything work in that system. So As soon as, soon as I saw him, not that he can, you can't compare him to Brady, but it right. just looked like, I mean, it, it just the way, again, super smart. Uh, all these all these quarterbacks are very very smart. This whole this whole group, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's Trey, Z- uh, Zach, Trevor. I mean, this is just a real, you know, football smart. Sometimes you can be football smart and book dumb, and sometimes you can be book smart and, and football dumb. Yeah, I mean, really. So um, he, he, you know, as I said, I but Mac, I love the way he. I love his long passes, um, even though he doesn't. He didn't have the strongest arm, but his placement. Now I know he had great weapons and stuff, but I just. I really like him. I think, you know, he's a per, again, perfect placement uh, to, to go to the Patriots. I just, I, I was just hoping that he wouldn't go there. I just I said, and, you know, go to somebody else who, who isn't going to know how to, de- you know, to, to develop a, a drop back quarterback anymore. I do think, I do think this, um, I think he fits well in there because you don't need a strong arm in that scheme. You really don't. Um, I, and I've seen so many times the setup for, Tom Brady to throw that 40 yard pass when it's one on one and they have everybody else set up to stay away from there so they looked for the penalty. I've seen that so many times. The 40 yard yeah. pass to look for the holding or to look for the whatever and it would get yep. you downfield to get you that better opportunity. And they did it last year with Cam Newton as well. So I'm like, okay, so it's not Tom Brady. It's it's what they're doing. It's their offensive scheme. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, McDaniel is uh, excellent with offense. There's no question. And like he had to adjust completely because Cam Newton was completely different mm-hmm. than what he had before. Again, that's a sign of a great coach to me. Yeah, is you got somebody completely different than what you had before, and then somehow you make them. So of course, he got COVID and different things like that. But that you were able to to change. You know, to, that's why to me, Sean Payton is so great. You know, he can go from all different kinds of quarterbacks. So I'm gonna give you um I'm gonna give you a little bit bigger list of the wide receivers that went this year, okay? Okay. Okay, so obviously we're gonna go Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Waddle, I'm gonna to go Tony, and I'm gonna say Bateman. Ah, oh, boy. And the Bateman got hurt, which is a shame because yes. I liked I like Bateman a lot. I, really I did, did too. Really he like he has lot, so but... much grit, and he never gave up on the ball. Like he would, he would yes. stretch out. He would lay out for those balls. So I'm anxious to see what he ends up doing. Um, you know, again, I, uh, Tony, I really liked, but I don't know how de- if he's real dependable. You know, that's uh, if he's totally dependable, he can be a real great gadget guy. That's what you know, type of player that you can again. Do they know how to how do they how are they going to use him mm-hmm. and type of thing? So that's me. Waddle, I, yeah, those Waddle's great. I know I see where um, Jamar Chase is, which is really some, he's dropping the ball and stuff, which mm. is really interesting. Terrence Marshall's having a better a better uh, preseason than <laughs> than he is. Yeah, he is. So you know, it's really it's 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 funny. You know, it's hard to to say again um, with see with with the quarterbacks that they have. Um, you know, and who's throwing, you know, who's throwing the ball. Well, look at the, look when I know it's only preseason, but when Jameis was throwing it to the, to the, uh, the, the who caught the two touchdowns the other night, right. And for the saints, he's an undrafted guy that ran a four, five, five. So now we'll see how he does in, in the real season. Yeah. But, but I'm saying to you, see that it doesn't correspond. Everybody thinks you have to be four, three, five, or you have to do this. You got to do that. And some people just have a, have a knack. Um, like Jefferson did. Gabe Davis was one of my favorites the year before I, from UCF because I, I live near Orlando. I, I love wide receivers from UCF. Mm. They don't they don't always have all uh, you know the the height the measurables, but they they throw the ball a lot and they get open, uh, you know at UCF. And so I I was a big fan of Gabe Davis. My he, got, uh, he went in the fourth, fourth fourth round. My friend will be very happy to, to hear that. My buddy Ryan in uh, West Virginia, he is big on UCF. He lived down in Florida for <laughs> so long, and you know what I mean? So he was he's always preaching UCF. The one thing I did notice this year in the draft, so Waddle went to Miami, Devontae right. Smith went to Philadelphia, Jamar Chase went to Cincinnati. All the quarterbacks that were thrown to him. Right, right. I don't think they want to waste any more time with 
you know, let's get chemistry here. You have chemistry with this guy. We're going to draft him. He's good, and he's still on our high on our board. They did that with yes. all of them. Jamar Chase is with Burrow. Waddle is with Tua. Um, That's interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. Devontae Smith is think. with um, Jalen uh, Hurts. You know, I never thought about it, but you're exactly – that's very interesting. See, everything – anything to speed things up. Again, a lot of it comes down to contract. looking at the contracts down the road. Everything always comes down to money. So it's always that way. And if you can if you can start out, like you said, with chemistry ahead of time, mm-hmm. you know, that is, that is really good. It really is. So there's, uh, there's a lot of, lot of good I, – I was very excited when Moore felt us. And also Michael Carter, I was very happy to see him fall to us from North Carolina as a running back. Now, what do you, uh, in my opinion here, I see P. Ryan, right, slightly yeah. getting better. I, I just see that when he sees the hole, he doesn't hit it. He doesn't, he yeah. doesn't explode into it. Um, I still want to see Michael Carter in real time. Uh, I want to see him do this. Uh but for some reason, maybe it was the scheme with Adam Gase. You know, I don't, I don't know, or maybe you know, we didn't have a good O line either. But it's uh, no, he didn't have that explosion when he when he saw it. It seemed like he danced around a little bit too much at times. Yes, I, he, there's no question. This year, when I saw him at camp, P. Ryan uh, had either he lost weight or something, but he looked a step faster. Okay. than he did a year ago to me. Yeah, I, I don't think he's. I know he got. They said I think in practice today he walked off the field, hurt a little bit, <laughs> but I don't know how bad or not. But uh, no, I. You know, he. I don't. I don't think he's number one on the depth chart type of thing. Because Ty, you know, I love Ty Johnson. Yeah. And we kept. We and I. Look, Frank Gore. Nothing against him. God, he, God, he's a, you know, Hall of Famer. He's he played all those years. Absolutely wonderful. But why we kept running him? And you know, he's not even in the league anymore. And last year he's our he's our starting running back. Last year. Now this year he's not even in the league. Yeah. Um, and Ty, what Ty, you know, just has. We we just never had running backs with great speed. Now we got Tevin Coleman. And we got, um, and then you got him. So I, I'm, I'm really excited if they can block. Yes. Yeah. I'm below, below Powell. Say no may more. Not have been the fastest, Say no more. I, I, I love I, that I guy. Am, I love Bilal Powell. I am the biggest for, from the time that I watched him, met him, he, a team player, a guy that could block. That to me was so important. He could pick up that blitz better than any <sighs> running back in the league. And I'll hold that word to anybody. He would, he would just, lay yes. out. Pass rushers, love the guy, and I always felt that I always felt that he wasn't used enough. That's just my opinion that he wasn't used enough that they didn't appreciate. I don't know why, but I just just because he's quiet, he's wonderful. I just saw him when I was up there. I bumped into him in the restaurant, and he's just an oh, just the finest person. You and you know, he gave nine years. He's a true jet. We we don't have many true recently. Nine years with the Jets. That's yeah. like amazing. And when he stepped in. He did the job. He yes, did the he job. Did ever, you could. I always called him whenever I was tweet. I would say Mister Dependable because I always knew that no matter what, he was somebody that you knew was going to do the job. And I didn't. I wasn't afraid. I knew he'd give you everything he had on every play, and all. And 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 he was a total pro. He was just a real pro. Yeah. And I, I do. You know, that's what I'm. That's what I want to see out of these guys. These guys can run. Mm-hmm. Now, well, can they pick up the blitz and not get Zach killed? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and then short yardage, you know, can we pick up the third and one? Can we pick up the fourth? We, we're having a little trouble with that. But again, I know we're still learning in preseason, but that's going to be very important because we can't we can't have Zach doing quarterback sneaks all the time because that would be dangerous to him. I mean, Tom Brady is the best in the world at that. But we had um, when we made it to the playoffs, you know, when we had Rex Ryan and it was yes. third and one. We didn't have a thought in our mind whether we were going to get the first down or not. We knew we were going yep. to get it when it was third and one because that yep. offensive line was great and we had people plow through. Yeah, Tony Richardson, you had Thomas Jones or you had LT. I mean, you had right, you had um, you had some really tough, good running backs, and the as you said, the offensive line was just phenomenal. Just I, <laughs> I felt bad for uh, what was the running back Green? Oh, Sean Green. Sean right. Green. I felt yes. bad for him because. Um, Coming out of college, obviously he was a powerhouse. Uh, but when he started to play full games, he was he was done. He was exhausted, but yep. he still carried it. He went as far as he could, you know. And I think yes. Ivory, Chris Ivory, I loved having that guy on the team. Yes, he, and Rex Ryan would always just say, just like, just keep 
keep going through. You're going to come out the other end. You're going to come out. You're going to come out. And eventually he did, and he would break off those 40 yards, 50 yards, you know? Amazing. Yes, he, he was like a mini Marshawn Lynch, you know, kind of phys- real physical type of guy. And that's what, you know, I don't think we really have – we don't have a runner like that. Now, one thing I'm watching is Wesco. I'm really – watching him because he looks like he's starting to come on uh, with his blocking. Cause we really, I, I know he missed it on, on that one it was third or four, fourth and one, but I'm seeing he's, he's really working hard and I see him really working on his blocking and actually catching passes. So, you know, sometimes it takes guys more than a year or two to, to, to develop and get where they, you know, might be. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm hoping he can come through on that. Um, I don't know what happened, you know, on Chris Herndon. I just, I, he had such a great first year under Todd Bowles. Um, I, my, my opinion with that is, and I, this is, I'm going to go down a little, you know, the trickle effect here with why I think Wesco is going to be the starter, I believe, by almost next year. Um, mm-hmm. I think that Herndon did have a good year. Um, and then when they concentrated more on that run game, run game, and he didn't really get the kind of snaps that you would expect, you know, throw it to the tight end because our offensive line was terrible. Now, yes. no excuse for dropping passes and everything. You get paid to catch the ball, and I understand that. But when you're out of rhythm and you don't get that type of thing, that, that ball anymore, and you don't catch it and catch it and catch it, well, depending on the person, that could really mess you up mentally. And, you know what yeah. I mean, it could be – a little bit more anxiety ridden when you're like, all right, now I got to step up. Like you shouldn't have no, that obviously when you get paid, but th- I no, think that took they're, a lot. They're, 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 hu- they're human just like us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> when they signed Griffin too, you know, it's kind of like looking at Griffin, you know, he was amazing. And then he got signed <gasps> and he got hurt. So I think yep. Griffin's, yeah, I, he's fading yeah. his way out. You know, Daniel, jo- or, um, who is it? Uh, Daniels? Joan? No. Which one? Our other, um, our other tight end that we have. Oh, oh yes, uh, with Daniel Brown. Daniel Brown. Um, now that we have Croft, I really think in Croft is only I think a one one year deal, I believe. Yes. So I think yeah, he's yeah. going to be out too, and I think West Coast is really going to kick it in next year. Um, whether or not, it, I wouldn't be surprised if they traded Herndon after a good either. year. Yeah, I mean, because depending. I mean, if, if we can get something for him, um, mm-hmm. that would, you know, because right now, you know, he may, he may need a fresh start. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it is, it's hard to know. And you would think usually a tight end is a quarter when there is a pass rush is a quarterback's best friend, either the outlet pass to the running back or, you know, the tight end. And uh, it was such a shame last year. There were so many, you know, a lot of, a lot, lot of drops that way. And Daniel Brown is really good on special teams. So that's what saves him. So he's um, a good blocker. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, we don't have the, you know, the the elite tight end, but we have some, you know, just solid guys. And if they if they just do whatever they are supposed to do, I think we'll be okay. Well, I I also think this. Like uh, everybody wonders why, you know, Kittle fell to the you know third round or fifth round or whatever. I think it was the third. Yeah. But it's like, well, you got to understand that system worked specifically well for Kittle. For any tight end, really, it got the tight end open. So yes. again, like even uh, even Russell Wilson was taken in the third round, and look how well he's doing. It's all about the scheme, like you said earlier. That's what I say. Oh, so much so, it makes such a difference with the, you know that, that type of play. Yeah, I know. I mean, Kittle is like, amazing what he does, and, and he, of course, he has that. You can see, yeah, he just has so much fun. I remember when I was working at the Pro Bowl and I met him. He just has a a way about him. He just like Devontae Adams, there's something about them. There's certain certain people that just have this spark that man, you just you can see that they love the game so much. Yeah. It's a and you can tell when he's playing playing ball, he loves ball. Even if he's hurt, he wants to you know, he wants to stick around and you know his <laughs> All exactly right. Exactly, you're exactly right. So I think it's going to be. As I said, there's, there's just so many, so many facets to this game. Of, and, and as I said, it, it keeps evolving and keeps changing so much. What are some of the things that you looked for when you were a scout earlier that has changed nowadays that is a little bit harder to grade? Like. Uh, quarterback number one, because okay. that's I said, that's so, it's so different now. Um, you know, as I said, if, uh, just in what they're what they're looking for, it, it's it's just completely completely different. Um, 
you know, not running uh, running back. Offensive linemen, you just used to be always just one on one. Now you have that zone and you're doing different things like that. And they have now with the quarterback being more mobile, it's very it's very different for an offensive lineman. Always knew where the quarterback was. So again, in college, they're not they're they're doing so much more running. They're not emphasizing offensive linemen. And first of all, the, this, remember we used to have oh man, so many great offensive linemen every year that were just you know, they, you knew for sure they were going to be unbelievable tackles. Lots of guards. Guards yeah. seem to be okay, but <laughs> tackles are not easy to come by. Um, linebacker, again, what happened in the old days, when you were a tweener, which is what, like Sherwood and um, Hamza, uh, both those guys that were safeties, now they're trying to make them linebackers. Those guys would have ta- a hard time making the team in the old days because they're not, they weren't strictly safeties. And they, we needed guys that were 220, 235, like a Greg Buttle or different things like that, that to play linebacker and to stuff the run and meet the guy head on. Um, now it's how do, you, how do you pass cover? And, and it's, so it's very different, too, in the pros. You're not going to do it that much in college. So that's another part that has changed so much. And they're changing positions. They're changing. So many uh, guys are, again, situational. You never heard of a defensive lineman coming off the line to go and, and go into coverage. And now you do. So uh, all those things have really, uh, can a guy, you know, handle all that kind of stuff. So it, it really does, um, to me, you know, make a difference. I, when in the old days, you could have said, I could pick out a, a linebacker, you know, right away. And you knew who was going to make it. But now, very, very difficult. Yeah, and it's different with the linebackers now because you have safeties, you know, merging as as linebackers now that's it yeah and that's what's so hard and can can the guy do it can the guy come into the linebacker and then cover and then go back and but what how is he going to, if the other team decides to have a they may go to some bigger running backs and these guys won't be able they, they may be able to pass cover but now they're not going to be able to take the running backs on hmm. if they're bigger if they're a scat back yeah no problem because they'll be able to do the you know the isaiah simmons those linebackers and um you know from uh, the colts um Oh gosh, um, Darius Leonard. Mm-hmm. And, you know they're only like two fifteen, two twenty. They're really light. Yeah. And everything, but they can, they can, but they can move. But now, are they strong enough to take on, you know, a big backs? You know, if Marshawn Lynch was playing, yeah, he'd run right through him. I think he'd run right through him. I uh, I was so excited, you know, a few years ago, I, I wasn't expecting a, a huge organizational change. Right. I, I you know uh-huh. I, I wasn't. We saw the money getting spent. We saw the yep. draft picks that we were. Yeah, it seemed to be actually starting to work, even though the a lot of draft picks we had during that time were not working. But we had Marcus May, Jamal Adams, linebackers, C.J. Mosley, Avery Williamson. Those four alone yep. are amazing players. Then you had Leonard Williams, Quinn right. Williams. The Sons of Anarchy, right? Isn't that what we had? <laughs> that's right. That's, that's what they said. That's right. And we had Anderson, who was traded from the Colts for a seventh round pick. And he was great with that tag team with Leonard Williams. Yes. And a Todd Bowles defense that went with that. Yep. That was, to me, I was so ready for that. I was mm-hmm. calling it a top five defense on paper. I know that uh, Bowles likes to blitz like almost eighty percent of the time. I was, and you know, we had Tremaine Johnson, which ended up being a bust. Yep. But with that front line, you didn't really need crazy amount of cornerbacks who were who, who were excellent. You just needed mediocre cornerbacks because that would throw off the quarterback himself to where you just yeah. needed a decent quarterback or corner to come in and swipe the ball or just be in there as the quarterback through a not so good pass, you know? Yeah. I was so ready for that defense. Yes. <laughs> I know. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how, t- how things, how things changed yeah. and, and what happened? Oh, it was, I know. Cause it really looked, and now it looked, look where we are. As I said, we thought we were set even when we in back, even before that, when we said we had Sheldon Richardson, mm-hmm. Mo Wilkerson, Right. And uh, and Leonard Williams, we thought, oh, man, we are. Whew, we are just we can't draft any more inside line like that because we are we are set for years. And then 
everything fell apart. Yeah, yeah. Womp, womp, womp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was really excited at that point, and then when things started to go downhill, I was like, all right, I guess we are, I mean, you don't want to hear it every three years that you're in a rebuild because then you're always in a rebuild. <laughs> you know? I know. So, but I, I believe that this right now is the right way to do it. I th- I really, I I'm so happy he's concentrating on the O-line and the D-line and then he has the draft capital within the first two rounds, three rounds to actually get the other people, the wide receivers, the running backs, the, you know, like making it yes. look good. And I think it's really important because I think, first of all, I love, I love the idea of, of hit, building through the draft, of course, hitting on the draft. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully, hopefully the guy's not getting hurt like they've been getting from the last, not this year's, not, not this year's class, but the last year's class has so many guys that, you know, were injured for some reason, but if they get healthy, these, these two drafts building that way, but I, I, and then having a brand new quarterback and he looks like he's going to be the real deal mm-hmm. if things go well, but it's, I'm, I'm not counting on this year. I'm counting. I'm waiting for another draft mm-hmm. and another free agency before I really even think we're going to be, you know, I'm, uh, especially now that we lost those defensive players. So if I just see the guys playing really hard and I see some development of maybe a couple of the young guys coming through, like Sherwood coming through, you know, any of those guys coming through, that will be very, very encouraging. And that, especially on offense, you know, if our defense is not great, they've been carrying us for years and we never score much. Yeah. So if we can end up being a, a team that scores, um, I think it'd be so exciting for Jet fans to think we could score <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and go, you know, and not always three yards and five yards, but be able to that way, but also throw them downfield and have the receivers. I mean, when I, what, what Sam, poor Sam was throwing to last year, you know, it was really, really tough. You know, the last time we had the really good was when we had Brandon Marshall yeah, and, uh, and, and Eric Decker. But we couldn't win that last game against Buffalo. Everybody thought we had that game won. It's like we just took it for granted. If we win that game, the whole history is different in the last 10 years. You know, how, how, how fast, how, you know, things can change on just one thing. And Fitzpatrick had had a really good year. And then, boom, if we go up to Buffalo and everything that could go wrong, wrong. So yeah. it just cha- it changed it changed the Jets' history completely. Speaking of like throwing the ball downfield, now I, I I've heard I've heard rumors of this. I'm not I'm not too sure about it, but when Joe Namath used to throw the ball, I heard it had a zip on it. Like you can hear something on the ball, like as it was oh, thrown. He, had, he he had first of all he had the quickest release. You know they said Marino was like second, but Joe had the quickest release. He was a great baseball player as well in high school and everything, but. Um, and if he had been healthy, he was a really great athlete that could run and do everything. And, but his arm and his just his his just his release. And back in those days, you know, you, you didn't have little jet sweeps and the little passes that were two yards that count as a touchdown pass. We were throwing he was throwing a ball. He was throwing the ball downfield a, a lot. It was a very different time. And yes, he threw interceptions. But back in those days. Um, because they threw the ball, interceptions were not like freak freak out times like they are now. Mm-hmm. It's funny that you, now if you throw an interception, everybody just oh my god, he's the worst quarterback in the world. Yeah, yeah. And some of the best some of the best quarterbacks, you know, whether it was Warren Moon, whether it was Brett Favre, whether it was Joe, they threw tons of interceptions. Yeah. So it's just a very different world right now. I forget I forget who it was, um, but back in nineteen, I want to say it was. When I actually started counting those 1940s, 1950s, um, the quarterback actually threw more interceptions than he did touchdowns, and he was actually ranked one of the top quarterbacks in the league. See that? I mean, as I said, it's, it has changed. That's, that's one of the things. Just like um, I was did this one thing study too. You know how they de- devalued running backs, so to say, back in the 70s. I was I did a thing. I don't have it here right in front of me or anything, but um, in the first 10 picks. Um, in, in the, I did like by 10, by the, each, by every 10 or 11 years, starting with this, you know, uh, I think I started with like 1970 and going on and it used to be, tw- uh, there would be 25 running backs to six quarterbacks that would be taken in the first 10 picks over, over a 10 year span. Then now it's, and then it would slowly change every 10 years, keep closer and closer and closer and now we're to the opposite way. So, so where you have uh, 25 quarterbacks hmm. or 28 quarterbacks taken to six running backs in the top 10 in the last 10 years. So it's, it has the whole, that's where I mean, the whole game has changed that way. 
since, especially since the CBA what, in 2011. What was one of the uh, what was one player that you wish um, would have made it to the New York Jets or one of the other places that you were um, that you never that they never picked or somebody that you were really giddy about and you just knew he had it and it just you know just didn't work out or pan out the way you thought? Was, wow, there were a lot of players, you know. That's why when when uh, Michael Carter got drafted this year, that was one of my guys that I really wanted to have drafted. Most times it doesn't happen the, that, like, say, my so-called, like, you know, little extra favorites. Yeah. Um, you know, get drafted. But there were, there, oh, gosh, there were so many guys, as I said, whether it was a Joe Delaney that, that I scouted at that time. Um, I'd have to go back and, you know, Hugh, Jacks, Hugh Jackson, uh, the linebacker, um, because I did a lot of film studies and university of Pittsburgh at that time had like 12 guys drafted in one year. They had so many Ricky Jackson and Hugh green and uh, Randy McMillan. And they had um, um, then Matt Cavanaugh and they had, um, I mean, they just had, they were just loaded that year. Hmm. And um, so all, any of those guys, um, as I said, I always had different people, um, uh, whether it was way back, whether it, I don't, whether it was Randy Gratishar, um, and I would argue with my uncle or my dad on different players. Cliff, 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 it's so funny. I left about Cliff Branch because I remember you now he came out before I was working for the Jets. But we we had gone to the Colorado Ohio State game way back when I was at Ohio State, and I loved Cliff Branch. And my dad was saying, ah, I don't know if he's. I said, No, I think he's going to be great. Just like Ed Podolak was another one. He was before your time. Ed Podolak for the Chiefs. And those were there were certain people that I always liked. We didn't get them. But the, I always said, OK, but they turned out OK. So I felt that that's how you start to feel kind of good or say, OK, maybe maybe some of the people and I was wrong on a lot of things, too. Though, but at least some of the people that you say, OK, some people think they're good and some people don't. And they turned out OK, then maybe I should rely a little bit more on what I think, you know, kind of thing, because it takes it takes a while to get confidence in yourself because hmm. you're going to you're going to be wrong. I don't care how great a scout you are. And I probably say you're wrong. I, I'm guessing, you know, 40 percent or depending on anybody can get not anybody, but most people can get the first round. Right. Second right. round J jets have been pretty loud as the other than Gaston, Wesley Walker back in the old days, then David Harris. Okay. And Marcus may pretty good, but most of the time, second rounds, we haven't done well. Yeah. Um, and stuff. So, but what can make your team is let's say if you can get anybody from those rounds, four to six, to be good and that's what i would love to see happen because we have you know in these in these drafts if they come through that's what makes you i think a, a really good team when you say oh yeah like a kittle who was a fifth round pick like we said when those kind of players come through you know greg buttle was a third round pick they're different when abdul salam but those they, he was sixth round and and klecko too when those things happen bobby jackson the defense back both those days and he was a later round so when all those people come through that's when you feel like you've, uh, you know, done something and you start to get a little confidence in yourself. Yeah. What, so what exactly do you do now? Um, what are, are you working for, for another team or do they ask you for help? Do they? Well, actually what I'm doing now, I'm retired. Mm -hmm. I, I live, I, I live in Orlando and live near, right near my son, his wife, my grandchildren. I just got back from two weeks spending the only time I've missed in 55 years going up to training camp was last year because of the pandemic. So I, I, I did go up these past two weeks and was, up, you know, was up at camp. Um, I just had my, you know, my website that my son made for me about 12 years ago, just so that we could kind of put down that I had been the first female scout and about different things like that, pictures of the, of the old guys, all that kind of stuff. And the next thing I knew, social media just blew up, you know, and Twitter and Instagram and all these different things. And uh, I got very big onto Twitter. And so I could w read all the stuff on all my, all the Jets beat writers and all, and then Jets Twitter is wonderful. I love them dearly. They are great people. Jets Twitter is so loyal and great. I love them. So I would, you know, I, I would do, I do that kind of thing. So I do these podcasts and then I had a young lady write the book uh, in, she, in 2014 or 15. She came to me, Elizabeth Meineke and said, I'd like to do a book which um, she came to jet camp with me in Cortland and the jets were great. Unbelievable. And then she came to Gastineau's house with me and we stayed there. And so she got to know him and then all this different stuff. And the book came out and then, so then things happened. Then NFL films saw that and um, 
they they did an amazing piece. They were NFL films is like, wow, that was that was a dream beyond belief. They're so first class in everything they do. And the, the um uh Katie Morello which just did a great job with the whole thing and came down here to Orlando and they filmed me up with the 50th anniversary with the Jets and then with a uh, inner squad game uh talking with players and all that stuff so I was so blessed with all those things and then you know as I said I've been interviewed by uh you know Janae Coakley of SNY she's so and she's so great and so many different people I can't even tell you so that's where I spend a lot of my time um, of course all I do is watch all my sports shows um, I spend all my life listening to everything I can about football and watching college games. I never leave my house from sat- on Saturday. I watch football all day till it ends at one in the morning and then Sunday's football. Um, and then whatever other nights is football, you know, I just, it, it's something, it's a real passion. Yeah, no, that, and, and I think that's, it's the way it should be. You know, it's, there's not a lot of people, you know, that, it seems like it's dumbed down sometimes, you know what I mean? If you're in a relationship or, or you know, like oh, he or she watches too much football, or not, it's like it's not, you just don't get it. It's a no, passion. It's, just, it's, it's an absolute passion. When you love it, it's something, I mean, during the pandemic, I, think, I said Roger Goodell did a fantastic job of how he did the draft virtually, that whole thing. You know, when nobody thought that could be done. We didn't know what we were doing, right? Nobody knew what was happening when the draft was like um, just after everything had gotten shut down. Then they figured out how to do OTAs and how to without having training camp, and then to have the entire season, which thank, thank God you know it really gave us something to watch and so much joy. And I just want to say thank you to Roger Goodell because I thought he did, and and this Doctor Sills, who is always on you know, explaining what's happening. They did an amazing job of getting through a season all the way through to the Super Bowl, uh, which I never thought was possible. And um, so, so that, again, that really gave a, a lot of joy. So I think that's what it is. And the Jets now with Joe Douglas is wonderful to me. Um, uh, I, I've been really blessed that the, the Jets still treat me like family. That's awesome. What um, What's one piece of advice you would give to... Um... Not just women, because it, I, I I like to think that it could be a little bit harder doing that job in that time set. You know what I mean? There could be a couple extra challenges in that time frame. Um, but to people in general as well, you know, how to move forward with this kind of passion. You know, what 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 kind of advice would you give them? It's interesting. It's interesting because, again, this, you know, back back then they didn't have um, colleges that had majors, say, in, um, you know, sports administration or getting a master's or uh, courses to how to be a scout or anything like that. Okay, so so it was very different. Now they have all these different things. Plus, if you're in college, most important thing is doing an internship, as I said, you know, whatever, whether it's in college or pros or whatever you can find, do that make yourself invaluable, be there. Nothing should be beneath you as far as doing something. If they want a cup of coffee, go get it. Um, and, and just show your, your love. And then, as I said, it only takes one person to believe in you. And you never know where, again, where life is leading you. You go on this path and we don't know where it's going. Um, we don't know where the turn is, where God has planned for us or what we, and, and as we go along, different things happen. And so you just, have, as long as you have that passion and you want to do it, don't, I said, don't let anything stop you. And I said, girls, for women nowadays, they have um, flag football. They have tackle football. They have uh, these career things that Sam Rappaport with the NFL is doing for like career things for people to get hired. So there's a lot of um, opportunities that there never were before. So I think, you know, I just say, just f- find what you love and don't, you know, don't give up. Especially, uh, you know, Rob Carpenter, his, you know, yeah. what he's doing up to us sports. And, um, I believe that's what it's called. And he, he's working with that and that's all it is it, you know, focused on, you know, women flag, you know, volleyball, you know, all that stuff. And it's, and I think it's important. I think it's very important. It is. Rob's great, you know, for a for, former jet. And I, I was I was blessed that the, when I was up there, we were sitting in the family section and I got to, I was sitting with him and it was just wonderful to watch you practice. Here's a former wide receiver. And 
as I said, they don't hit like they used to in practice and um, do all the contact stuff. But he, I loved him being able to sit there and tell me on certain routes and what was happening and what his thoughts were and what he saw. Um, it was one of the highlights of my trip with Rob. It really was. He, great guy. Awesome. Awesome person. Yeah, I've had him on the I've had him on the podcast twice, and he's just stand up. You know what I mean? There's no other words for it. He's just a great person, you know. He he really is, and he knows his stuff. And as I said, you you could you can feel it when he's talking about it. You can say, oh, he he knows exactly what they're doing and what's happening because he's actually done it. Yeah. So, um, and that's why I said with, with some of the women like a Lori Locust and some of the others that are in right now that are have they they've played tackle football and. Um, and they've done flag, so they ha- even have much more of a conception than uh, than I would have had way back, you know, when I started, because we didn't have anything like that. So there's a there's just so many more opportunities. Um, the other thing is, don't be afraid to start small. A lot of people want to go. Oh, I'm going to be. A, I want to be in the pros. I want to be a coach in the pros, or I want to be a scout. Sometimes you have to say, okay, first I got to start scouting high schools, and let me see how I do that. Maybe I help a college a little bit there. Or maybe I have to be a qual- you know, quality control. Even you know, when you look at Robert Sala, it t- when he quit his business world, it took him twenty years to get where he's now. He did quality control. He did all kinds of things, working his way up and here and there and moving. And the same thing with, um, you know, with with scouting or anything else. You just don't think you, ha- you can't, especially now that more people are getting into it. You can't always start at the top. Um, you have to be willing to work um, and especially and now that women it's now it's more commonplace guys and women equally you got to treat them equally now yeah absolutely connie where can people find you online um and where your website and your book sure i'm always known as connie scouts and you so that on twitter on instagram and on facebook so it's it's all Connie Scouts. Uh, the name of my book is X's and O's Don't Mean I Love You uh, by Elizabeth Meineke. And it's a story. It's a positive story. It's a story of my life through, you know, through the years in football and uh, and the Jets. So if you like the Jets or you just like football in general or you have a, um, a guy or a girl you know, or a young lady, it's a, as I said, it's a positive. It's a positive book because I always felt that there was I had a blessed life and I know that I did. And I enjoy sharing every moment that I can with people. So I just hope I want what I want for young people because there's so much negativity out in the world right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Connie, it has been an absolute pleasure. You are an inspiration to everybody. Um, and I am so happy and I'm so overwhelmed and just filled with joy that I was able to have you on my podcast. It's an honor. Well, it's my pleasure, Brian. It's so, so nice to speak with you. I really enjoyed it. J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Good to talk to you. Take care. I have to go. We have to leave now. I have to leave. We have to leave now. I have to go. go. Well, see you later. <laughs> <laughs>